Good afternoon. The next talk is from Michael Meek, who is a strong supporter of free software. He is the general manager of Collabora Productivity and the director of the, the Document Foundation. And now his talk will be how Collabora Online and Moodle can enhance education. So, Michael, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, vielen Dank, Martin. Ja, um, ich habe Deutsch gehört. Uh, das ist wunderbar. Ja, ich uh, habe sich uh, vermisst. Um, aber mein Deutsch ist schrecklich. Uh, uh, Entschuldigung. Um, so, und mein Englisch ist uh, zu schnell. So, oh, Entschuldigung. So, English. Let me uh, switch to English, if I may. Sorry uh, for that. Um, and let's get on with some slides. Where, where are these uh, buttons here? Good. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about Collabora Online, uh, which I know a lot about. And I'm going to talk about uh, Moodle, which I know a little about, um, but which is a wonderful uh, integration for us. Uh, I'm slightly uh, cheating here. Uh, the, the real heroes behind this, and you'll, you'll see on my slides later, are Michael Witka, uh, Jan Dagerford, uh, and, and some others who, who are working uh, to create uh, this plugin and make it work beautifully uh, with Moodle. So perhaps you know about Moodle, but you don't know about Collabora Online. So, so let me tell you about that. So Collabora Online is sort of built on top of the awesome LibreOffice technology base. You know, 35 years of work on interoperability and uh, you know making your documents render beautifully, despite all of the weird and wonderful things other people put in documents. Um, so it's extremely rich. Um, it's extremely powerful. It's extremely interoperable. But on top of that, we layer uh, collaborative editing, and then, of course, we target uh, multiple platforms. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, that is a, is a, great, a great thing. Um, one of the things that we, well, there are a number of things we don't do, and I'll come on to those uh, later. Uh, some of those are uh, storage and authentication. And so in order to uh, store data and, and documents, we need someone else to do it. So there are a lot of someone else's. Uh, so obviously, own cloud, next cloud, uh, C file, eGroupware. There's a talk after mine, I think, from eGroupware uh, to to show off their their integration, uh, or a learning management system like Moodle or Chat, Mattermost, and you know, Dell uh, or, or Filer or the you know Microfocus Filer. There are a number of other a large number of other integrations, and those really provide two things. They provide um, storage of the, the documents. Um, and then also uh, authentication, identity, uh, permission models, and, and the management of that. So uh, yeah, so Collabora Online, of course, is, is not a web service. It's something that you run yourself. It's software. And uh, you deploy it on your premise uh, under your own control. And so that gives you a huge degree of freedom. Uh, this, it's an open source solution. It gives you, you, know, it gives you back your uh, digital sovereignty, your control over your data. And, and so that, that's, that's really cool. Um, in terms of uh, a pragmatic solution, it's something that we can get there uh, uh, quickly, and we can deliver huge value very, very fast. So uh, we've tried to avoid rewriting the 8 million lines of code that is LibreOffice, <clears throat> or is it the 14 million lines of code that is uh, Microsoft Office in JavaScript, partly because JavaScript is arguably the worst language in the world. Well, I mean, there are a lot of competitors there, but I think I think really it's it's got a lot going for it in the in the winning the worst language uh, stakes. Uh, but you know, just rewriting code doesn't help anyone. It duplicates the amount of code in the world, um, even if you could do it, and it doubles the number of bugs and it halves the number of people to work on each of them. So there we go. Best line of code is the one we didn't have to write, and our architecture is a bet on CPU threads and network getting cheaper ultimately. Uh, we render a lot of stuff on the server, we calculate on the server, and we push it to you over the network. It's incredibly more efficient than a VDI solution, but there is some degree of <coughs> slight similarity there. Obviously, it runs inside your browser. Uh, but in, in terms of efficiency, much more is shared on the server, and maybe I'll talk about that. Uh, but it, and, and loads of people are getting it. So 50 million, this is an uh, obsolete number now, but large number of Docker images uh, going out there, and people running this uh, themselves. So in terms of key features, then we have easy collaboration. Um, we have uh, real-time editing, obviously. Uh, as you type, uh, you see what everyone else types exactly at the same time. Uh, there's no lag there. Uh, we have commenting. We have redlining or change tracking, as you'd expect. And you think, 
you know, this is obvious. Like, this is all easy stuff, right? Everyone has that. Well, actually not. So if you look at uh, Microsoft Office uh, 365 there, online Word product, there is no redlining, uh, change tracking built into that product, which is just slightly strange. It's, it's nice to be able to know who, who did what, who who's suggesting what changed the document and so on. Um, similarly, WYSIWYG editing is something that's been thrown out of the window to, in the race, race to collaboration there, and, and something we provide really, really nicely. So, uh, yeah, some, some good, good, good distinctive features there that, that people love and should be familiar from, you know, any kind of uh, office productivity application for the last, well, for a long time. Word 5, I guess, was probably less WYSIWYG than you might hope and text only. <clears throat> um, wikis, I guess, are not WYSIWYG. Uh, typically, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so we can we can give you the the layout. The what you see is what you get. A WYSIWYG layout, and also uh, you know all this functionality. So there are a lot of cool things there that are you know kind of uh, distinctive. So providing that rich functionality gives you just a lot of control over over what you can what you can do, how you can uh, lay out your documents, uh, adapt images, but all, all, all kind of functionality there that's extremely rich. And you see, we uh, bring the sidebar there. Um, from LibreOffice that you'll be familiar with. Um, so uh, we bring a whole huge uh, depth of detail around, you know, page styling, you know, and, and, and so on that, that makes it, it very easy to uh, create a, you know, powerful, a powerful documents. And, you know, you, you can be sure that as you print it out, it looks, you know, uh, like it looks on the screen, which is, uh, well, I, I don't know, that's, that's usually probably qu quite a good thing. As I say, it's, it's been, um, it's been missed out in much of these uh, more modern products. So cool stuff. Um, of course, we have a spreadsheet as well. You know, the full full suite of uh, formulae interoperability uh, people are, are used to, um, and extremely fast too. Obviously, it's running on a on a on the server side. So you know, in, in burst mode when you need lots of calculation stuff, we can thread, uh, we can calculate your your spreadsheets, your big spreadsheets, very quickly and deliver them very very rapidly uh, to lots of people. And similarly, presentations. Uh, you know, we, we do that too. So we talked a little bit about this. Um, so people often are a little bit nervous about security. Uh, I think you know it's worth uh, saying you know that well while we're editing it, your document is incredibly secure. You know it comes and it lives inside a uh, a ch root uh, which is which is locked up in lots of ways. So inside that each document has its own own container um, and that has virtually nothing on the file system inside it. Um, all of its system calls are watched and filtered uh, by the system to get rid of anything that looks out of out of you know line. I guess it's a bit like app armor or something like that, but it's it's much simpler. It just uses set set comp uh, button packet filters on system calls. And but then of course the software is going through you know very systematic load crash testing. We load and save uh, something like hundred thousand documents and you know save them in different formats and try and catch uh, problems there. We have an amazing uh, Kverity score. I guess not on there is the things like the uh, the Google OSS Fuzz, uh, which you know has this, these huge huge numbers of clustered work nodes running ASAM, uh, trying to do evolutionary algorithms to find you know to get best code coverage, uh, find a problem, and then minimize the test reproducer for that. And so, so lots of this work is done inside the LibreOffice core there, providing this very robust uh, LibreOffice kit. I think then if you're even more worried, you can wrap it in virtual uh, machines and obviously we have it inside Docker containers. And all of that goodness then runs on your server room, on your network, on your CPU. And what we send to the devices then is, is essentially pixels, um, you know, or, or well, or much more uh, intelligence than that, you know, the, the bits about the layout of documents and its geometry. Um, so, so that the document data actually never leaves your, uh, your server room. So you're, you're completely sure where it is and who's accessed it and so on. So then, of course, we plug that into Moodle, and uh, we want to provide all of these, uh, you know, uh, pieces of functionality in that rich document editing uh, directly in the Moodle environment. Uh, so you can uh, present information there, so uh, people can come in and interact with that uh, very easily. Whether it's you know sort of sample spreadsheet and see how something works, or whether it's uh, you know just course course material that you already have prepared and you already have in your your familiar document formats. So yeah, so there's really two two ways of doing that. So so one is with this uh, activity module, so that this really allows people to you know collaboratively edit and, and and you know create documents. And then there's a whole submission flow there, so that you can create assignments and give them to people, and you can then review the results uh, coming in, which is which is kind of cool. 
So you want it, but how can you get it? Well, um, the easiest way then is to go and get code, which is our development edition. I guess it's the Fedora uh, to the CentOS or, or that we use. Um, we try all of our latest and greatest, coolest uh, things out inside code, uh, so you get them somewhat ahead of time. And there's lots of ways you can get that. There's a Univention uh, App Center will install it easily, or Docker Images, uh, another very popular way. We have raw packages, or you can build it yourself. It's uh, all of it's there, um, and get get stuck in, which is cool. And having done that, of course, you then need to install the Collabora Moodle plugin. And uh, or you know there are two two actual plugins for those different bits of functionality you might want. And then there's one easy to configure setting. I mean, it's just you know you've got to point it at the the URL uh, of the, the image that you're running that, that hosts Collabora Online. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the people there, are, 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 you know, they're great. I mean, these guys are visionaries. You know? they're, they're, they're doing wonderful things. And please do get involved. You know, if you need uh, new features, uh, you want, want to get extra functionality in there, um, that, that should be reasonably, uh, reasonably easy. And they're, they're, great, they're great people to work with. So uh, check it out and have a look. Uh, and so, well. Yeah, here we go. So you can you can add these to your uh, activity, you know, pretty pretty trivially, and you can you know lock that down and see uh, you know control what people can do obviously with those those activities and, and restrict uh, configure exactly what it is you want want people to do, and uh, you know you can you can protect your documents so that they can all be read and looked at and played with, uh, but but are read only uh, if if you don't want people messing with them. Seems like a good idea. Uh, in, in many cases, um, and then you know you can have a collaborative these collaborative uh, documents to uh, in assignment, so so people can work on them together or individually, and uh, yeah, you can you can see what sort of file types you want to accept. It seems, um, and and how does that all work in the background? Well, I, I mentioned I think before that the uh, the data goes uh, the data and authentication is then all done by the integration. And so the plugin that the plugs into Moodle, its job is basically those two things: um, to manage all of those permissions and to tell us what what we can do with the document and and what each user. So I mean, it's easy for one user to be able to edit it and others just view it or comment on it or, or this kind of thing. Um, and so yeah, so, so either way, then we essentially an iframe embedded into the application. Uh, and we serve our, our JavaScript to there. Um, that iframe gets passed an authentication token um, from Moodle. And we then give that back to Moodle to, to say, hey, give, give us the document uh, for this person. Give us this document with this authentication token. Oh, and tell us about this person. What's their name? What do they, you know, what's their avatar? How, how, can, we, how can we best represent them in the UI to everybody to show you know, multiple people writing? And off Moodle goes and it gives us the document, uh, the web, web get. And then we, we do a web put back to uh, to save it again. It's it's really uh, that simple. And and that's a good thing. Um, so so I, I tell you all of this because some people install Collab online, and then they say it doesn't do anything. And of course, it does a huge amount. Uh, but it's kind of a microservice. You know, you need the it's it's like a massive microservice. You need the rest of the uh, the infrastructure around it to manage that uh, document uh, and store and load and uh, authentication piece. So you really need both both those bits uh, to use Collab Online. So Moodle is a great example of, of how that goes together. So Collab Online 6.4x. So our latest uh, release is 6.4, and it brings a whole load of uh, different things. So, so one of the feedbacks we've had um, is a user experience needs to improve. So previously, we started uh, with something that looked a little, little like what we have at the bottom here, um, which was really um, much more familiar to people from Google Docs, let's say, and uh, people familiar with a simple menu, a menu and toolbar, and and that works that works nicely. Um, and then, of course, other people are very familiar with uh, you know the Microsoft world and this this tabbed uh, notebook bar uh, view that they provide. So in recent times, we've we've provided that as well. Um, and there's an option there. You can actually now configure it into the integration, but but there's a little setting in the the setup, and you can change. How that looks then very easily um, to taste, uh, possibly. So, so I, I think there's a, there's a view among middle developers to not have too many options and settings, and that seems wise to me. So, so I think at the moment you want to configure that for your whole estate, either to look like one or the other. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is just to get the whole thing out of the way. If you click, uh, you know, a second time on your home bar, for example, it can just collapse uh, to to give you a you know a smaller menu there. 
which is great. Um, and it's interesting to know that, of course, the latest Microsoft uh, Office Online then have a single line toolbar, which is a contextual notebook bar type thing. So everyone's going in circles there. But either way, we have, we have the options uh, that, that people want so they can feel at home and, and get productive. And so that's, that's really a new thing in uh, six four. I'm very pleased with that. What else? So, oh, okay. So there's been quite a lot of PDF uh, improvements here. So often people want to share PDFs uh, with people uh, as a sort of formal written record of something. You know, here, here is the version I sent you. Uh, but they want them to get collaboration around that. Uh, so getting comments on those PDFs, um, annotations to them um, is, is an important new feature in, in 6.4. And so we can do that and do that collaboratively, which is nice. Uh, for those of us who print things out, uh, we've got a new feature here for, for binding, particularly for binding and setting margins in the gutter, like the middle of the, of the page. You can see a picture, I guess, up here of, of how that looks out. Uh, that turns out to be really uh, useful, uh, particularly in government, but I guess also probably when you're getting your thesis uh, you know, uh, bound and, uh, and, and written up and so on. Uh, we've done a whole a chunk of work for uh, font work. So, so we've all, as I say, we bring LibreOffice into the browser um, and make it collaborative. And we've had Writer and Calc and Impress uh, from, from the beginning. Uh, but there is this draw element that then provides a whole load of more uh, functionality. Uh, and to make that available uh, for, for schools, you know, doing uh, you know, communications and, and, and drawing and um, you know, pro providing uh, posters and things. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of sort of paginated uh, graphical stuff that people want to do. So we've been uh, helping uh, bring that to the browser too. So graphical text artwork there and font works, you know, fun funky things that look uh, fun. Uh, freeze panes so that you can you know, see your spreadsheets better without jumping around the place all, all of the time. I landed. Uh, macros. Uh, so you know, visual, visual basic or star basic macros are probably a terrible idea. Um, but you know, they're popular. And, and people have built all sorts of little business flows around them. Uh, and you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to stop users typing into these bits and constrain things there and do, do more powerful interactions? I think we could probably even throw up dialogues and show them in some cases too. Um, but either way, it's a limited subset of, of, of Visual Basic support and Star Basic support because many of these APIs were not really designed for a collaborative editing world. You know, how do you how do you manage that in, in, in a scripting way is, is, is unclear. But it's improving uh, significantly, and we can uh, you know if you if you want to allow this as an admin, you can turn it on. It's off off by default. So that's, that's kind of useful. Um, just improving the ergonomics and calc, you know, moving and copying sheets. Uh, pivot tables uh, we've added, which is uh, particularly useful, I guess, in a business context for understanding unstructured data. And if you've never used pivot tables, you probably ought to, because they're just an extremely powerful tool. You know, do, do it once, create a few pivot tables, see, see how they go, just to see the understanding and the insights you can get out of a massive say git commit data or something like that. It's, it's quite a really useful tool. There's another interesting thing though about uh, pivot tables, which is this native dialogue uh, work. So, so um, at the moment, we're sort of in 6.4 and a halfway house. We, we are trying to do more and more of the user, user experience and UI on the client side inside your browser in JavaScript. And we're making great progress there. So the notebook bar, whole, whole lo loads of the dialogues are already, well, a number of dialogues are done like this. Um, but some are still pixels. And uh, this was one of the first dialogues here where we started to really do a much more powerful dialogue um, in this way. And, and essentially what we do is we convert <clears throat> what is ultimately a Glade-defined XML user interface into widgets of some kind in the core, which generate JSON, which we send to the client, and then we build, build the UI, and we talk JSON back to that dialogue. So the dialogue is sort of half implemented in the browser and half implemented in the back end. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can reuse all of those dialogues. And this is some work that was done in, in the LibreOffice core by, well, primarily Red Hat uh, to get better GTK3 integration. Um, so, so in the bad old days, we used to do a lot of pixel bashing um, in the toolkit use in the LibreOffice core and you know, literally painting individual pixels around the place you know, to, to do all sorts of things. And, um, and we would try and force the toolkit to composite its, its widgets onto that. And that works quite well. 
I mean, you know, for, for many years, it was a lot better than, you know, our, our own homemade toolkit that we had before. Uh, but the problem is that when it comes to the latest, most trendy things like, you know, CSS animations on buttons as you mouse over them and, and all of those things that the designers love, it's just not possible to replicate that it, without actually using the native widgets. So LibreOffice in the core then is increasing you, increasingly using native uh, GTK widgets. And so there's a big work to decouple all of that in the core. And a, a huge benefit of that, of course, is then we can decouple all of our um, our dialogues remotely as well uh, using the same same mechanism. So another brilliant example of code sharing and, and reuse. And of course, you know, just a huge, huge scale there of, of testing and debugging and deployment and experience and with that. So, Exciting stuff, and we want that to be uh, coming to you to the sidebar. That's you know we're doing a whole lot of other bits there too. <clears throat> other new features: so manage manage ranges, name ranges, print ranges, all all of the things you expect around uh, ranges and spreadsheets. Um, we've added a whole load of statistical tools, which you'll not find in any other you know online um, in browser uh, product. Uh, and again, I think using native dialogues here. So there's whole loads of things that people like to do. Uh, to, uh, to analyze their data uh, that we can now do, do easily um, online. Uh, I mentioned the new module, uh, Draw. Um, there's a whole load of uh, things there around uh, shapes and connection points and flow charts and all sorts of other, other good things uh, that are going in there. Uh, let me see if I've got a slide about that. Maybe I have, I have. So uh, you know, getting, getting connectors and glue points and shapes and diagrams going is, is, is an exciting problem and so, uh, Mertz has been working on that for some months, and uh, yeah, we're now shipping some some great things there. I mentioned font work. I guess this this also shows the mobile uh, UI. So I don't. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit actually. Um, but this is this is a sort of mobile phone view uh, of what we're doing there, and uh, yeah, here's a bit more to reassure you that it's uh, it's it's not going to bite you. Another big thing that we just landed in 647, uh, which came out, I think, last week uh, of that order, um, is improving the crispness. So, so one of the problems is that some, <clears throat> some browser devices are, are, are zoomed. And one of the interesting things you should be aware of is that you know, people try and save your browser from doing unnecessary work. Um, but but if, you're, if you're not at 100% zoom, you know, every, every picture is, is interpolated as it's rendered. And, and on Chrome, there was a particularly embarrassing Chrome bug, I think, where <clears throat> they were getting a device scale, um, and they were, they were dividing by 1,000 instead of 1,024. For some reason, it was a, it's a, like a binary a fraction. So almost all of the Chromes were at, like, well, 97.7 device scale, uh, which just meant that you know, when you were trying to put pixels on the screen and make them uh, crisp, there was just a horrible interpolation, uh, all, all the performance and quality issues going with that. So we've rewritten a whole load of our, our tile rendering, and we've dropped, actually, interestingly, we previously had a map widget. So uh, you know, we were describing your document and its coordinates in latitude and longitude under the hood, uh, which, is, which is quite amazing. I mean, it was, there are a number of coordinate transforms inside the LibreOffice core from 20ths of inch points, and an inch point, well, a point of, you may know, is a 72nd of an inch, uh, which is, you know, I don't know, and a 20th of that, and so there's a lot of archaic units, but, I, but it really was the icing on the cake to, to map this to uh, you know, latitude and longitude in, a, in a, a certain map projection to get your document. And that's now broadly uh, going, uh, gone. So at least for the, for the tile rendering. And that, that then simplifies the code. We've moved it to TypeScript, so it's much uh, less awful than JavaScript. And uh, part of that was a split pane work. Uh, but that then enables just a faster, more simple rendering and more smarts. So uh, client-side uh, calc grid rendering is one of the first things there. Uh, but we'll be doing page outlines and uh, reordering how pages look and all, all sorts of other things uh, to, to get a better, better experience on the client uh, built on top of that. And then good 6 has a whole load of pieces you can't see. So like we've, we've done lots of work to improve rendering time, uh, better cell interactivity in, in calc. Uh, it turns out there's lots of pointless resizing and, and silliness there. Uh, we've in, instead of hard linking our jails, uh, you remember I, we put things in CH root jails, these, these tight containers. Oh, we have now some very optimized by mounting uh, pieces that create and destroy these with, with a few system calls instead of a large number. Um, watermarking is better, lots and lots of things, improvements in impress, uh, PDF 
uh, performance improvements, uh, fun mailing. Um, and doing things on iOS too, I'll talk a little bit about mobile in a second, uh, but uh, yeah, just making, making these mobile apps look nicer. Much more substantial Cypress automated test coverage, uh, very, very useful, obviously, uh, for making sure things don't regress. And, and helping people debug clustered a setup. So obviously, Collaborate Online scales incredibly well to a large number of users, um, but it's easy to screw that up. You know, it's very important that we get everybody working on one document into the same server. And so we can then help, help check IDs and, and make that uh, easier for people to detect when it's gone wrong. And lots more. I can't tell you, uh, you know, <laughs> all of the work we've done in the last uh, six months on this. Uh, loads and loads of bug fixes and improvements. Uh, we're also shipping this stuff on Android, uh, iOS, and of course uh, Chrome OS. So um, here's a tablet view, which is used in a you know a number of schools, uh, and you can see it's, it's looking uh, pretty pretty. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we are doing, and you know, it's approaching a million uh, installs now on uh, Android OS and Chrome OS. One of the things we do there is we take the sidebar, which perhaps people are familiar with. Um, and you remember that we're converting this into JSON under the hood, or we can do. And we then wrap that and do, well, as, as good a job as we can of presenting this in a sort of a one-hand touch a mobile experience that perhaps, uh, you know, be familiar to anyone uh, working with that. So, you know, you can get all of those, those awesome bits uh, from the sidebar and the, the richness of the functionality there and apply it then to, you know, your mobile UX very easily. And so there are things there that you can do that you, you, know, you just can't uh, easily do elsewhere. And conversely, we've really improved the LibreOffice sidebar you know, for chart editing, chart type stuff, so that that then works nicely on mobile. So there's a really beautiful synergy there uh, around sharing the code and improving those experiences uh, in tandem. That's, that's been just great to see. And of course, running on Chrome OS, it's, it's really nice. Um, of course, actually, that's just the Android app running there. But under the hood, the Android app has the whole Collabor Online, LibreOffice, uh, LibreOffice or LibreOffice sitting behind it. And so, you know, it doesn't matter that it's not a mobile phone or a tablet. We can provide really the full PC uh, mobile, uh, full PC experience there. And we can run offline, um, which is great. So, so you can uh, work nicely there on your Chromebook. Brilliant. So of course we're doing loads of things, but we can't do everything, and we really appreciate uh, other people getting involved. Um, so there are really two ways you can do that. The first thing you can do, of course, is get stuck into LibreOffice. You know, it's it's a great project. Uh, we love it. Uh, there's the code there. You can check it out or get involved links. And you know, there's a mix of languages there. So C plus plus, Python. Um, there's lots of localization and, and things that need doing. And it's a thriving German community. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, if, if you're allowed to be proud of your nation, uh, then, then, then Germany has done amazing good, amazingly good things around uh, uh, LibreOffice and uh, OpenOffice before it, I guess, you know, creating and nurturing and providing uh, you know, a, a, an environment. And of course, the Document Foundation is based in uh, Berlin, uh, which is cool. Um, and yeah, so there's loads of good things uh, that can be done at, at LibreOffice. So do, do get stuck in there. And that's around 90, 98% of the code underneath like Collabora Online. So Collabora Online is a little bit on the top. The Moodle plugin is even, even smaller. Um, we're really all about reusing code and getting rich functionality to everyone and, and making those features complementary. So you, typically, you add the feature to LibreOffice, and it's there in Collabora Online, and it's there on mobile, and it's there uh, on, you know, on Chrome OS and so on, which is great. And then, of course, there's a Collabora Online piece on top. Uh, we also have uh, Easy Hacks, which you can go and uh, you know, play with there. Uh, we have translations in WebLate, and it's slightly different. I mean, there's a lot more JavaScript and CSS and design work. Uh, there's, a, there's a different UI there. There's more freedom uh, to change and tweak and improve things. Uh, there, or at least it's easier often to, to work with. And there's a C++ core that is there running and proxying and managing all of these uh, LibreOffice key instances. There's a forum there, and we have weekly development meetings. If you want to show up, say hi, uh, tell us what, you're, you know, what you'd like to work on. Uh, we're we're up, well up for helping you there, so do uh, check those out on our uh, website above. Here's my team. Uh, just a quick plug for Collabora. Our mission is to you know make open source rock, and uh, you know we're doing it, and uh, and we'd love to do it with you. Um, I think one of the distinctives we have is that you can see the ocean here. This is our annual conference in Almeria. Um, we, we are not trying to boil the ocean. 
There are only a few things that we can do, and we want to do those as well as we possibly can. So we're just fully focused on being an office piece uh, that, that embeds into other people's wonderful products. You know, there are, uh, and yeah, I think that's, that's useful to, uh, to have a reasonably well-defined scope. Uh, there are some more talks, so uh, let me just advertise Stefan Unverich's talk, uh, which is, I think, in this room uh, next. So very little effort required to uh, to get the next uh, dose of excellent content. And if if I can't persuade you to that, how about Mike Saunders, who's, who's also just a fantastic, uh, you know, enthusiastic, uh, wonderful marketing uh, person, and and he'd be able to uh, to get you involved in LibreOffice uh, and, and tell you what's happening in in the next round of LibreOffice uh, seven two. Uh, which will be coming, I guess, in another three, three to, to, to five months. Um, so, yeah. So do do, and, and he's in session three, I think. So, uh, so next door. There. Otherwise, I think that is pretty much the end of my talk. I probably gave it about twenty percent too fast. Sorry about that. I had a little bit more time, um, but I'm very up for any questions or comments or anything that anyone wants to ask, and I'll do my very best uh, to help. So, thank you for being here. Um, over to you for questions. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. My pleasure. There was one question that I see in the chat, and the question is, how, how about responsiveness of the interface and usability on mobile devices? Sure, sure. So that, that, that is a great, great question. Let me just pop back to, uh, to here. So, of course, uh, you know, when you're on a mobile device, there's a whole load of uh, choices that you need to make, and uh, the question really is then how to how to best adapt your UI to work nicely on, nicely on mobile. So as you shrink, I mean, if you play with Collaborate Online and, and, and do you know, just just to install it and play with it, um, we're not massively good at changing the UI radically as you shrink the window. Um, we're a lot better if you select a mobile device type and reload, um, and this is. Just uh, you know, if someone wants to come and optimize that, that's 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 wonderful. Um, but uh, typically, we, we find that phones don't tend to turn into PCs uh, very suddenly. And um, of course, they do rotate, and, and we adapt nicely uh, with the UI there. But as you can see, for a tablet, uh, we we typically use uh, just that notebook bar view there, which you know, has reasonably large uh, icons uh, that you can get hold of. And of course, many of the things that are good for touch are good for Mice users as well, you know, nice big grab handles, making it easy to uh, you know tap and, and move things around. But when you get to a mobile phone form factor, you need something totally different. And so we have, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you can see here, but uh, you know, this is a portrait mode, and you can click a little button at the top, and you get this palette uh, from below, and that would then give you, you know, a, a diving menu. So you know, if you click on the font name, it'll provide you a list of font names. And in theory, you can do it with one finger, one, one thumb, or you know, one hand. Of course, most people prefer to do it with two. Um, and so that's, I, I hope, very familiar to, to many people. It's also there in the PC version. So, so there are really two uses for that. One is um, uh, to have a fat client app that works offline. So you can install Collaborate Online on Android. Well, do an app, have a go, play with it. Um, and that you're effectively running a fat client application there locally. Or say if you're running Nextcloud, you can uh, have it embedded inside that. So you're, you're then talking to the server, the Collaborate Online server, and you, know, you can collaboratively edit using essentially the same UI, uh, but inside a, a Nextcloud surround there. And that, that's really useful because there are some things you can't easily do in the browser, uh, copy, paste, um, permissions around various things uh, that you can do if you have a helpful application wrapped around you. And so, so integrating like that is, is kind of good, and of course, you know, for, for a large application that you use infrequently, or maybe you use it frequently, but if you want to edit that document, it's nice to have a server to help you that already has it loaded, that is, is happy to consume the, the memory and disk space or whatever, let's say your mobile phone doesn't have to, uh, and that starts absolutely instantly, it's already started, and that has loaded your document in massive parallel on a, on a very, very large big cache processor and has rendered it you know, way before you could have loaded the local app or the, you know, even jitted the JavaScript to run a, you know, a local app. So I think you can get some great performance from, uh, and well, all that goes with that, you know, battery saving, uh, power uh, stuff, reduced temperature as it doesn't burn out of your pocket and so on. 
uh, and you can make that then work nicely um, inside your mobile phone with, with the same user interface here that you see in the app uh, that will also run there. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, do you think that answered the question, Martin? You, it, it was long. So. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the answer. No there are sadly no other questions in the chat. Well, so I can advise that uh, everybody joins you in the Jitsi meeting afterwards. Great. And otherwise, you can uh, the people can stay in the chat and visit the next talk, um, eGroupware or Liper Office, as you mentioned before. So I think there's another one in another session. I'm not trying to uh, do that guy down, but I'm just excited about the, the eGroupware and the LibreOffice talks myself. So I'll see you in a Jitsi room if you want to have further discussion. Thanks, everyone. Good of you to come. And I'll head off to this Jitsi room now. All the very best. Bye. Bye.